it's Scott Manley here with Eve or Bust Part 4 and we still haven't really left for Eve because I had another stroke of inspiration. Yes, uh, I noticed somebody had released a new mod and it was tailor-made for a mission to Eve. Therefore, I present to you my SSS, my surface, sea and sky um, exploration vehicle. This uh, sits nicely on top of a rocket. It's largely built out of B9 Aerospace and Hooligan Labs. And, well, I need to use mods for this. I know there were people whining about using mods, but uh, first of all, B9 is actually a developer, therefore his mods don't qualify as proper mods. But secondly, uh, you can't do what I'm about to do with re without mods. And they open up so much of EVE to us that I just could not go to EVE without using this. Okay, the launcher is going to be 100% stock, right? That's, I don't care about that. That's the hard part is lifting off. This is going to do some cool stuff. So, it is a two-man vehicle. It actually has room for two more in the back, I believe, using that little hatch that sits on top of the B9 fuselage. Um, you see it's got like a cool air intake at the front and a bunch of, well... I don't know, big grey wart they look like. You'll find out what those are once I get down to the surface. We have the flight engineer plugin installed, that's just giving us some data on what's actually happening. I was aiming for that kind of lagoon area there, but I guess I'm coming in just a little short. Nevertheless, we are getting low enough where I have to turn on option number one. What we have here is the airship mod, yes, hooligan aerospace of course. Uh, inside the cargo bay there, notice. <laughs> it folds away neatly inside the spacecraft and you're supposed to remember to open up the cargo bay using the action groups first before you actually activate the buoyancy control. But uh, it acts as a giant parachute that it will slow my descent and eventually make it able for me to fly. And that is a great thing. Also note in the top right I have B9 compressed, well that's compressed air basically, right? You can't see the whole phrase, but uh, what I'm using is the RCS thrusters here are the linear RCS that use compressed air. So they take air from an intake and they provide RCS-like control while you're inside an atmosphere. Therefore you don't need to worry about using up any fuel, the only thing you need to supply is power. This is excellent of course, the whole thing is nuclear powered on the interior, there's a bunch of RTGs there because this thing is going to find itself in locations where the sun may not reach and I don't mean at night, I mean this is going going beyond the grasp of the weak rays of the Kerbal Sun and actually you know if you do the mathematics on the Kerbal Sun you'll find out that it shouldn't really be a sun, it should be a brown dwarf but this is of course some other magical universe where the laws of physics are slightly different uh, which is why we have planets that are ten times smaller and uh, everything's ten times closer and everybody's green. So yeah, the B9, they have these linear RCS units. They are great for airships. That's why I combined this with the Hooligan Labs airship mod. And that actually has been around for a while. If you remember in Reusable Space Program, I was going to take a couple of probes like this. One was going to go to Leith and one was going to go to uh, Joule and they were going to cruise around and collect all sorts of fascinating scientific information. Now this actually happened as well with for reals. The Vega 1 and 2 were Soviet spacecraft that visited Venus and actually they flew past Venus and on to visit Halley Comet. But while, as they flew past they essentially dropped off a lander and some balloons which flew around the planet in the about 50 kilometers up I believe just collecting data on winds and other things like that. But now uh, we're getting down to the surface, we're about 20 meters up, we're switching back to normal speed here, and coming down very slowly, and just in case you're wondering, no, this is a post-commentary because I couldn't think of anything interesting to say at this time, I know there's a lot of discussion. So yes, now we get to introduce the second feature, Hooligan Labs a few days ago released a new mod, Hooligan Labs Submarines. So what we have is a ballast control and the buoyancy control. So I'm going to fold away my giant balloon-like thing and it takes a while. It, it does wobble a lot, but I would just take that to being that there's lots of waves on the surface of the Kerbal Oceans. So I, I pretty much use it in the same way as before, or the same way as the, the airship mod works. 
but uh, these uh, help me go down rather than go up. And one of the things that the B9, uh, the B, well not the B9, the Hooligan mod changes a lot of things so that your your ships will tend to sink rather than float, um, or your kerbals very specifically. I've found out. <laughs> So I've told it to start going downwards, and you see the rear is sinking first, but uh, I planned for that. So these, uh, you can adjust the pitch on these, and I've assigned these to action groups, uh, so that everything's paired up. And just by hitting two and three, I can make it pitch forwards and backwards just by adjusting the ballast load. And once I'm below, I can, I'm down there below the surface, let's turn on some lights. This is what I was saying, underneath the ocean, you know, that light doesn't go too far and still carries carry enough energy to be useful. Although, you know, it's shown that light can actually produce photosynthesis a long way below the surface. It's quite surprising. And uh, indeed, it was uh, a requirement. One of the big problems with the snowball earth theory, where, uh, you know, ancient times, 600 million years ago, the earth was supposedly completely covered by ice. A lot of people at the time were, well, when it was originally being discussed, they kept on throwing up barriers. And one of the, the objections was that uh, there was no way for life to come out to survive after that. They'd show no extinction event. The, the cyanobacteria that were photosynthesizing managed to live through several million years of a completely frozen earth but it's shown that you know with when the ice freezes very slowly it is very clear and you could actually have colonies of bacteria that were photosynthesizing a long way you know deep underneath the ice you know several like tens of meters below the ice apparently anyway where you see we're descending very slowly the if you look at the top, the altitude gauge is increasing, but that's just because we're going in negative. Uh, you see there the the RCS units still work. Obviously, instead it says compressed air, but clearly the in air intake is actually sucking in water, and those are now water jets, right? That would make far more sense for this system to actually be using water jets instead, right? But, uh, you know, the air intake will work for the same thing. I mean, you know, air, water, they're both fluids, technically. Looks great from the inside as well. I like the light off the bottom of the ocean. I just wish I had a better cockpit for this. Like, that uh, fire spitter panel, it would be nice to have one on either side instead of in the middle so I could, you know, take a look out front and see the bottom of the ocean. Obviously, we want to go exploring the oceans on EVE. I, I understand they may be full of rocket propellant or something, which you know doesn't actually make much sense, but it's a cool concept nevertheless. No, uh, we can, we've leveled out, we're like 25 meters above the bottom. We want this thing to, to be able to go to EVE and explore the bottom of their oceans and bring back more data. It will be capable of taking a couple of pilots with it, but it's certainly not as, it's more compact than the the giant lab that we have if you remember the the mobile lab which we're going to bring is going to be much more capable it's going to have a full set of laboratory instruments and experiments this is just designed to get a look in places where the where the mobile lab cannot go so now we just get ourselves down on to the bottom and that requires a little bit oh, of poking around with the with the pitch operations here. <laughs> yes, no, we're, we're actually practicing for the rodeo. And that's us. We have touched the bottom. 344 meters deep. If you go below 600 meters on Kerbin, it will crush your hull and you will be destroyed. So don't do that. There, we, we can get out on top and something has been changed. The Kerbals do not, in fact, float up to the surface. They actually walk around on the bottom, which is great because we can, you know, get them to pick up samples and analyze things and, you know, look the part, basically. Maybe maybe I should get the universe replacer and replace these spacesuits with something that looks like diving suits, huh? Anybody want to do that? <laughs> like old school diving suits? Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, wow. Could you imagine replacing Kerbals with the big daddies from the Bioshock? That would be really bizarre. Yep, look, he's just sitting there on the bottom. And 
doesn't go anywhere. I'm, I'm actually afraid to jump. If I jump, I wonder if I'll just float up to the surface or something. We're planting a flag. No flag is visible. I'm not sure if the flag model just doesn't work when we're outside, the, <laughs> when we're not in the water. Do flags flutter underwater? They actually do if water is flowing. Because flowing water is just like a wind, but uh, much harder and denser and more powerful. Uh, you know, the winds on Venus are much more powerful as well, simply because the atmosphere is so much denser. Like, uh, it'd be very easy to imagine the spacecraft that were sent having to have been blown over in the time they've been sitting there. And yeah, Jebediah runs up front so we can check the visibility from inside the cockpit. And look, there he is standing. That sun is still up there, but I'm sure its rays are being filtered through 300 meters of ocean. They could surely couldn't power anything here unless the developers hadn't thought of that. In which case, it will probably work just fine. But we're not going to risk that. We're taking a nuclear-powered sub submarine down here. Or a submarine airship. A nuclear-powered submarine airship. Yes. And come on, come on, come on. Yes, they're excellent. The only place in the solar system we could send something that could be a submarine slash airship that would make any sense would probably be Titan. I think that's the only place that has liquid of any sort on the surface, other than Earth, and an atmosphere. But uh, I, I would think that you probably wouldn't combine both of these and both of those functionalities into a single entity. You would have one thing that flew and one thing that landed, and they wouldn't switch back and forth. But, I mean, we have, want to send our Kerbals to the bottom of the Evian oceans. And by Evian, I mean the planet Eve. I don't mean the oceans that are made of Evian water or Evian water or however you pronounce that. That would just be really bizarre and very expensive to have ocean-sized quantities of that very fancy water stuff. Okay, uh, some problem with balancing my ballast. Um, what way did we do this originally? Yeah, oh, there, that's more like it. Hey, okay, now let's return to the surface and return to airship mode. So... We've already demonstrated this can sit on top of a rocket. We will put this into orbit and we will attach an engine to it and we will send it to EVE as well. We then need to figure out how we're going to get everyone to where they need to go because the, the crews probably don't want to sit inside this spacecraft for the 40-day journey to EVE. They want to have better... They want to have more luxurious facilities for them. So we still need to build a spacecraft that can transport them. We're probably going to have individual boosters. We'll put them all into orbit, then we'll rendezvous and land with each of them in turn. We have picked out a landing site, but uh, I can't show you it in this one. Uh, once we reach the surface, the, the buoyancy control kicks in. We say, come on, lift me out of this water. Lift me out of the water so that I can fly majestically into the sky and explore that once more. Uh, yes, altitude control. I've only got one um, balloon on this because they are so much bigger. Actually, I think that is probably too small given the size of the object underneath it, but it does look rather better than having, say, a giant realistic-sized envelope. There we go, let's get this leveled out, and we'll start heading back towards base, wherever that is. Oh yes, we can always tell because of all the all the purple and grey markers showing the debris and abandoned spaceships sitting around the base. Sitting around the Kerbal spaceport. Yep, we pick up speed now, we're using the RCS system once again. And actually, in flight, the RCS, if you can get it stable, it's actually pretty fast. You can get like 20 something meters per second, which is more than acceptable. It's certainly as fast as any rover. It's certainly not aircraft speeds, but this does have the advantage that we can hover over the ocean and land in it and take up. I mean, this thing really can go anywhere. It just doesn't provide the most, you know, luxurious accommodation for doing so. Yeah, we want to we want to transfer the crew over there after we get into Eve orbit. And then they will land it and do some exploration and then rendezvous with the, the mobile science lab. Uh, also, the mobile science lab people will have to rendezvous with the, with the launcher because it will land and it will have a bunch of tires needing repaired. Whoa, 1350. Oh, 
uh, 98532. Oh, just made it over there. Excellent. You notice that I actually put down the landing gear because I was worried that I might collide into the side of a mountain. That's a really bad idea. Maybe I should put the crew module at the back. I mean, after all, it's not often that you reverse into mountains, is it? No, that's all. That's what I was told. You know, when you're flying an aircraft, fly it there, but sit at the back because, you know, you actually have a greater chance of survival. It's... Yeah. Although, uh, to be fair, in the Asiana crash recently, everyone that was killed was at the back of the plane. Um, but, statistically... The FAA doesn't really like to talk about these things, but yeah, back seats of aircraft have a slightly better chance. Not that it generally matters. Ah, uh, yes, airships, I don't know, because airships, they don't crash very often these days. In fact, the only air that I can think of a couple of airship crashes, but um, don't know whether it would have been better to be in the front or the side. I do know that in the case of the Hindenburg, it would have been better to just sit on board it and ride it to the ground, and that most of the people killed at were actually jumped out because they were saw the whole thing on fire. And there we go. Closed away. We are set. We have our vehicle, the SSS, ready to explore Eve, and it will actually be departing in the next episode for reals this time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.